All right, good morning. How's everyone? Hanging in there? Oh, uh, we're chatting some of us before, like, uh, been a lot of holidays and flex days and things this month. That's been uh, a little off. So I feel like I'm like happy to see you every time I get to see you, right? And then I don't see you Monday because we have our first exam. Uh, but that's, you know, planned and not an interruption. I'll talk about that at the end, but I wrote it up there just to kind of keep it um, on your mind. And we'll jump back into this, but uh, I will talk about that at the end. I also graded all of your uh, part one of your papers, almost all of you got like nine or 10 points. The biggest reason anyone lost points was just not giving me uh, like the citation information for a show, but otherwise a lot of fun, uh, a lot of fun choices, right? I, I know that papers aren't fun to write. They're not fun to grade either, right? But uh, but as far as papers go, I think this one's kind of fun uh, as much as it can be. So uh, I hope you look forward to spending more time with your character. I didn't give you a lot of feedback unless you were missing something. Uh, so most of you, um, I said like great or I love your love your choice or something uh, brief like that. Uh, the second part of the paper isn't due till like mid March. I almost said mid May. Mid May we're done. Uh, mid March. Uh, so we'll talk about that more after we get through that first exam next week. Mm -hmm. uh, any like questions or anything about? That first part of the paper, anything like housekeeping kind of stuff before we get back to this. Again, I'm going to talk about the exam and the there was an extra credit opportunity that popped up. I'll talk about that as well uh, at the end today when everybody is is here. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll go back. Right, we talked last time. We spent a lot of time. Just going to back up for a moment here because it feels like a long time ago. Uh, talking about stress, something that uh, I'm sure you're all very familiar with. This is like the time where all those first exams are happening and big assignments. So I'm sure stress is, is something that's there for you at the moment, unfortunately. And then the systems that are involved with the hypothalamus activating these different systems and the toll that that can take on our on our body, right? As our glands and that endocrine system and nervous system are activated. And then uh, we spent the last bit talking about trauma and then acute stress disorder and PTSD. Anyone remember what's the the key difference between the two? There's only one like main difference. Yeah, yeah. Time frame, right? This one starts right away or within four weeks, so pretty soon after something, and it lasts less than a month. It's small. It's cute, right? Not really, but like it's smaller. Maybe that helps you to remember it. Um, and then we said they have similar symptoms and triggers and so on. There is a, a disorder that. Now, this isn't recognized by the DSM yet. Okay? Now, this is something that is actually really, really gaining a lot of, I don't want to say popularity, that's the wrong word, but like a lot of traction. Uh, CPTSD or complex PTSD, uh, a little bit different, but it's something that has kind of entered the discussion a few years ago. And there's a, an offshoot of it called developmental trauma disorder which is now recognized in Europe and part of their system. They don't use the DSM. They use something called the ICD, um, which is just their version of, of our system. Um, and they recognize this and it's kind of offshoots. So uh, I would be shocked if this isn't in the next DSM. Uh, but complex PTSD is when people have post-traumatic stress, but it's not one instance. Right. A lot of the time when people experience a trauma, it's like one event or maybe like events in a very tightly clustered period of time. But this is somebody who's experienced like ongoing or like series of events. And it's typically something we talk about with childhood. Right. That maybe during childhood, someone had emotional neglect or emotional trauma or a parent died or left or they grew up in hostile circumstances. It's very commonly referenced back to childhood. And so what it does is it causes this trauma response. And it's it's a little different in the way that it manifests in the sense that it's got like this piece where there's a lack of emotion regulation. Oftentimes this can look a lot like borderline personality disorder in a different way. Like a lot of people who have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, we're actually starting to see that maybe it's more like CPTSD related. But um, a lot of similarity in the symptoms with like relationship difficulties, emotional regulation difficulties, a lot of like negative self-perception 
And changes in consciousness, meaning things like uh, dissociating quite a bit. We're going to talk more about dissociating and um, kind of derealization behavior in the next um, half of this chapter. But I have a little video that kind of talks about these. Um, I'll play it for you. Uh, but this is something that, again, is uh, kind of a newer uh mental illness it's been around but it's something that isn't recognized yet and likely will be soon so let me play this um, video for you and then we'll come back and, and talk about it more just kind of give but uh very similar to ptsd uh but again like differences in this in the sense that it's more of an ongoing trauma the flashbacks that we sometimes talk about are a little bit different with this as well so with PTSD, it's almost like you have dreams of the event, you see the event, or you hallucinate it, it's like on your mind. With this one, we tend to talk about what are called emotional flashbacks, which are a little different in the way they manifest. It's more like um, a feeling of being back in the situation uh, that caused you to have the trauma in the first place. So maybe somebody abandoned you and you have emotional feelings of abandonment, even though it's not happening currently in the current situation. So it's more like your emotions can kind of become overwhelming and create like a period of time where you're emotionally almost taken back to what happened to you before. And then some of the like, changes in consciousness and uh, relationship stuff is also unique to this. So we'll see. Um, again, I would imagine this will be included in the next uh, DSM. A lot of research and books and, and stuff about this right now. It's something that is gaining a lot of attention. Any like questions or yeah. thoughts? Anything here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. So the DSM-5 came out in 2012, I think it was. Uh, and so, and then they did a text revision update of it a couple of years ago, like a year and a half ago. Um, and so typically it just takes time for, there's a whole panel of hundreds and hundreds of psychologists. They have to review it and then add it. It just takes time. So um, I would imagine when they're doing all that for the next one, it'll be in. Okay. And yeah, they uh, they meet like constantly. They change the names of disorders, right? They take some out, they put some in. Um, but I think it just didn't make timing wise. So it's not a No, yeah, it's just not official yet. Yeah, but it, it's something that a lot of people are diagnosed with. So what they would diagnose in every single category of disorders, there's something called a, an NOS diagnosis. NOS stands for not otherwise specified. So somebody could have this, and what they would do is they would say anxiety disorder, NOS, not otherwise specified for now, or stress disorder, not otherwise specified. And so sometimes when people don't fit neatly into what we currently recognize, that's what they'll diagnose. But yeah, it was just a matter of, um, of timing, I think, more than, than anything. More research now than we had in, in 2012. Anything else for the moment? Yeah. Why doesn't do DSM written like every year? Yeah, I mean, so the first the gap between like the first and second one was quite long. It was like 30 years or something ridiculous. Uh, but usually it's like every 10 years or so, um, they end up with a new one or a revised one, right? So we just revised the DSM five, but I mean it wouldn't shock me if in the next few years we see a DSM six or a major revision to the five. It tends to be every like 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, so some things about why people develop these disorders and then some treatment. Uh, it's tricky because a trauma is enough to cause a disorder, right? Like by itself. But if you experience something traumatic, it makes sense that you would react to it and struggle. But not everybody who experiences a trauma develops a trauma-related disorder. So why do some, but not others? And, and we have a lot of thoughts and theories. Psychology is a million theories, right? We have theories for everything. Uh, but one thought is that maybe there's something biological or genetic. So Bessel van der Kolk, the one I showed you the video of who talked about what is trauma, would talk about like differences in the brains of somebody who maybe has undergone trauma at a young age and how that can wire you to be more predisposed to trauma later in life. So maybe there's something biological or genetic that makes you more sensitive. Maybe it's your personality. Everybody can handle different levels of stress and trauma, right? Like when I, I feel like sometimes 
the amount of stress that I have in my life would cripple like the average person, <laughs> right? Like my mother-in-law, it's always my poor mother-in-law, my mother-in-law, like the littlest thing she's done, right? Like she's in tears, she's, she's done, she's shut down uh, versus like, I feel like I could handle like 19 times what she can, right? Like everybody kind of has their own threshold for what is too much or maybe not even um, enough in a way to motivate you or stress you out. So your personality can matter how you were raised, right? Um, the things that happened when you were quite young, right? And how that might, again, set the stage for things like biological factors and so on. Social support is huge. If you have people to turn to when something happens, that tends to be an incredibly protective factor, right? So if you have friends or family or therapist or whoever that you turn to in moments of difficulty, that tends to be very uh, like shielding in terms of, of not developing a disorder. There's a lot of uh, multicultural factors, poverty, socioeconomic status, and like uh, influences of ethnicity and race that correlate with poverty and socioeconomic status. And then the severity of the trauma. The more severe, the more likely um, you might be to develop a disorder from it. So not everyone who experiences trauma develops a disorder, and we don't fully know why that is, right? But lots of theories, it's probably some combination of all of them, but lots of theories to explain why. There's also lots of things you can do for, for treatment. I love this, right? You start to get into this like word, like letter salad kind of thing. You can do EMDR to help you treat the CPTSD, right? Like it just, it gets a little like too many letters sometimes. But uh, one of the most common treatments for PTSD, ASD and CPTSD, all the ones we talked about in this chapter, is a technique called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Uh, and this is really a, a unique idea that didn't have a lot of scientific support for years, but again, gaining popularity, right? We are understanding it on a different level, and it's something that has become very commonly practiced. Uh, and the idea behind this is we do what's called like a bilateral stimulation of the brain while having you think about the traumatic event. And it's thought to help you digest it in some way. The leading thought is that if someone has a trauma, it's almost like it gets stuck in the brain. Like our memories all get processed and kind of digested, but the trauma got stuck and it wasn't like broken down and digested and absorbed in a way. And so by doing things like EMDR, you kind of help to break up that memory, help it to be resolved in a sense. Um, and really, really interesting process, right? Like I've been trained in EMDR and as part of the training in EMDR, I had to do EMDR. And I have to tell you, it changed my entire opinion of the whole thing. I was like, oh, it's just somebody standing in front of you, like moving their finger back and forth. And that can be the way it goes. I actually used what were called little tappers. Some people use a light machine. You follow this light machine back and forth and you activate the eyes. Other people use tappers to do like a bilateral stimulation where it activates you in that way. Um, but you think about something that bothers you while also having this activation. And again, it's thought to bring it to the surface in a slightly different way. Really, uh, really wild, really commonly used to help process trauma. And I found a little video that kind of talks about it similar to the last one. Um, I hope they're helpful. Sometimes it helps to hear things in a slightly different way. So I'll play it for you, just kind of giving chin. Uh, and this is true uh, in, in general of therapy, but it's also very true of trauma treatment is that it often gets worse before it gets better, right? And I think that's something to, uh, you know, that's important to know if you're going through any of these things, especially something like EMDR, oftentimes what can happen is as you're digging all of this stuff up, it gets significantly worse and harder before it can get better, right? But the idea is that you do some kind of, it doesn't have to just be the eyes, uh, some kind of bilateral stimulation of the brain while thinking about the trauma, um, and then it tends to help you move through it quicker. This is probably the leading method. Um, you need to do some kind of therapy in order to heal from the trauma. Kind of talking it through doesn't always tend to be enough, um, and medication doesn't tend to be enough right, to deal with the anxiety. So this is kind of the, the, the hallmark method, if you will, for working on uh, dealing with, with uh, PTSD. There's also kind of a newer thing that's also becoming popular called IFS or parts work. 
um, and looking at the parts that were injured. Maybe it's a childhood part that's injured within you and you address that part. So you could do IFS with EMDR to work on your CPTSD. Let me see if I can add any other letters in there. Right? Uh, it's So it's a little uh, like involved, right? But IFS is another thing that's starting to gain some, some popularity. Anyone done this or known, known someone who has done this? Any questions or comments or thoughts, stories, anything? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay, was that helpful for them? Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing, right? And and again, it probably was hard and got worse for a bit, but then at the end, outcome can drive again. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. Right? Anybody else? Any other thoughts or comments or stories or anything? A really um, popular technique. Like I said, it was a kind of viewed as like a, an alternate method of therapy for years, but now it's it's kind of become a core one. Um, and then where we'll go from here, where the other half of this chapter are about the dissociative disorders. So we've been talking about trauma and stress and the disorders that can come from it. There's another way that sometimes stress and trauma can manifest, and that's dissociative disorders. Uh, disorders in which some part of your personality is separated from the rest. Maybe you have memory loss or dissociation or multiple identities present within one individual. There's a couple of different disorders in this category. So we'll look at dissociative amnesia and depersonalization and derealization and dissociative identity disorder. So a couple of ways, and these are often, again, very trauma-based, right? They're rooted in traumatic experiences and extreme stress, which is why they find themselves uh, in, this, in this chapter. So uh, we'll look at some of these different disorders, starting with dissociative amnesia. So again, with every single one of these, there's some form of like memory loss or oftentimes like separation of parts of your identity and so on. Dissociative amnesia is when people lose memory for maybe an incident or something in their past without organic or physical cause. So there's no physical trauma. It's an emotional trauma that causes the memory loss. So if you've ever seen like the vow or 50 first dates or like English, not accurate, but like any of those kind of movies where somebody hits their head really hard and has memory loss, that is not this, right? That's called retrograde amnesia. Um, and that has to do with trauma to the brain physically or organically. With this one, what we're looking at is somebody has memory loss due to an event, right? Due to the trauma emotionally of something that happened to them. Uh, and this can manifest in a lot of different ways. There are kind of five main types. This would be a great short answer question, right? What are the five types of dissociative amnesia? Again, I love little lists like this. I won't ask you the difference between the first four because they're kind of a little bit um, confusing and they overlap. But I might ask you specifically about this last one, which is like a, a key term. But this can show up in a few ways, right? Localized is when somebody uh, remembers some of the experience, right? Typically beginning with the disturbance, right? So it's localized or kind of specific to part of the event. So a lot of people, for example, uh, when 9-11 happened, right? They said that they remembered the buildings getting hit, but nothing after that, right? So like once the event starts, you forget everything like that has come after. And so it's kind of specific or localized to the event. Selective is by far the most common. You remember bits and pieces, right? Like you remember bits and pieces of the trauma, but not all of it, right? And those bits and pieces can be different from person to person. Generalized and continuous are really rare. Uh, generalized is when you forget everything before the trauma. So you don't remember who you are. Maybe you don't remember the weeks, days, or even years before. And continuous is when you forget everything after and you can't make new memories. Very, very rare, but all of these, at least these first four that we're talking about so far, are due to an emotional trauma, right? And so once you deal with the trauma, oftentimes your memory comes back, right? It might come back slowly, but it does tend to come back. The most wild one up here, in my opinion anyway, is this last one, dissociative or disassociative fugue. Fugue, oops. <coughs> is Latin for flight. 
right? Like not necessarily an airplane flight, right? But to flee, to run away from, or to like leave home and go off on a flight. Uh, and with this one, people oftentimes will disappear from their home. They'll travel a distance away from their home and start a new identity. Uh, maybe they like choose a new name, a new job. Oftentimes, uh, this is more difficult to do now than it used to be because you won't have the documentation to support it. But people oftentimes due to trauma and stress leave and then they end up somewhere else with no memory of who they were before. Right. There was a story, um, I found one to share with you, but there was another story in the news. This was like 10 years ago at this point. Uh, this woman was about to get married, right? She was engaged. Their wedding was coming up, something with all the stress of the wedding and everything. She just went missing. And it turned out she had had a dissociative feud. She went four states over, started dating some new guy. Fiance wasn't very happy about it. They didn't end up getting married. So dramatic. It's like it could be a movie, right? Uh, but uh, she ended up in a new state, forgot where like she was from, forgot her whole life. And by the time it started to come back, she had done some damage with the choices she had made um, and it affected their relationship. This is really, really rare, but it happens. Uh, it's almost like you assume partly or completely a new identity. And I found a news story where they talk about this a little bit, so I'll play it for you. Um, oftentimes people will kind of come out of the fugue and they have no idea who they are or where they are. And what's happening. And so this guy in um, this story, he goes to like the news to see if anyone can help him figure out who he who he is. Play this for you. The amazing. And again, uh, doesn't happen very often. So I was super excited to find an example of this. And that people, if they've had this happen once, um, it can often happen again. It's almost like an extreme coping strategy of sorts, right? And so he took off, had no memory for who he was, confused, um, and then like trying to figure that out, right? And that's kind of the extreme. Like sometimes people will just like disappear and they kind of go off the grid for a little bit, but it can also include like forming a new identity or partial identity um, with loss of memory for the previous one. And it tends to kind of slowly come back, right? Like little bits and pieces of it will come back and like people are confused. And again, once you start dealing with the stress and trauma related to this, uh, it oftentimes can go away and disappear completely. Really rare, but really, really uh, fascinating. And it's not on purpose, right? This is happening without your, without your awareness. Another really common uh, dissociative disorder or elements of uh, common disorders, derealization, and depersonalization. Now there's a disorder where you have both, but these two things individually are very, very common symptoms. They're like the third or fourth most common symptoms that people tend to struggle with, right? Oftentimes feeling like things are unreal or parts of your body are like not your own or like the world around you is fuzzy, right? All of those things can be common. We were talking about panic attacks and those were things a lot of you mentioned that like getting tunnel vision or the world around you feeling blurry or not real. Those are elements of this. You get this when you have extreme stress or trauma, when you have panic attacks, when you have depression, like these are elements of a lot of disorders and they're a little bit different, right? So depersonalization is when you feel like parts of your body or like your own functioning are unreal or detached from yourself, right? Like, like you don't feel like your hand is your own. Like you don't want to amputate it. And that's that amputee identity one we talked about. You just feel like it's unreal. Maybe you feel disconnected from your body in some way. Derealization is when your surroundings feel detached and unreal. They feel foggy, right? Uh, I forget, I, I don't remember what it was now, but I took a medication for something like three years ago because I was sick and it created this sense of derealization and it was so like terrifying. I, I had it for like three days as it worked its way out of my system. Uh, but people who experience this all the time, like it gave me this like little um, insight into what that can be like. Like the world felt like, like it was foggy. Like it almost felt like there was a screen between myself and the world and everything just felt detached and far away. 
right? And it was like a side effect of this medication, uh, which I found out I'm like wildly allergic to like Tamiflu for whatever reason. Like I had like a flu and they gave me a medicine and I was wildly allergic to it without any knowledge. That was fun. Uh, but it gave me some of these symptoms where everything felt unreal. And that tends to be kind of a hallmark of this. The world around you just doesn't feel real to you. And you can have both of them, which we call depersonalization, derealization disorder, or you can just have them individually, or they can be elements of another disorder. And I'm thinking back to the panic attacks. A lot of you, again, describe these things under extreme anxiety. They're really common. People who've had trauma and are going through EMDR oftentimes do a lot of this as well. And so you have to do grounding exercises to keep them present. Uh, but these are, are common issues that can fall under this category of uh, dissociative disorders. Anyone have like stories or comments about these, like experienced feeling like the world around you is unreal or have people in your life who have these? Any like thoughts or comments, anything? Yeah. Narcissist disorder and like, it's really scary that she sometimes doesn't like recognize like where she is or like, hmm. like that. Yeah, right. So it can be extreme at yeah. times, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, and how scary, right? To like all of a sudden feel like everything around you is unfamiliar and unreal. It would be scary. It's really scary. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, right. And like, so as a symptom of something else, right, you haven't got an idea of what that would feel like. And this can be extreme or it can be mild, you know, like it's, it's almost like, you know, when you're in a dream, nothing quite feels real. And sometimes you wake up and you don't know what's real and what isn't. Uh, it's like that, but all the time, it can be really like scary to have an episode of this or like feelings of this. Um, and again, they're common symptoms, or you can have this specific disorder. And when people have them to the extreme, it can lead to something called dissociative identity disorder. Anyone know what this used to be called? It's gone by a couple of names over the years. Yeah. Multiple personalities or anyone know the other one? Split personality disorder. Um, you know, it's changed names a couple of times over the years, but DID or dissociative identity disorder is when people have more than one identity within their like physical body and in their mind, right? So it's almost like an extreme form of dissociation um, in the sense that you might have something so traumatic happen to you that you repress that personality and create another one to try and deal with it. Uh, this is also something that's relatively rare, featured in a lot of movies but not typically featured very accurately. Uh, like Fight Club doesn't do a great job of featuring this. Like it's a super popular movie about this, but it's not uh, very accurate. Oftentimes with this, what happens is you have people who have multiple identities um, or personalities, which we call sub-personalities, that can emerge and take over, right? And depending on the relationship between the identities, it can have profound memory loss related to it. Is that a... Split from the three like, yeah it's so exaggerated right um uh, i mean it's an interesting movie like um uh, but and like i think the, like the ideas behind it get at the disorder but the way it's portrayed isn't isn't very accurate no so yeah like split um which was like it was a popular movie it, it doesn't do the best job um portraying it right but it but it is one portrayal of it for sure there's a bunch like uh my favorite portrayal of this i don't know if any of you watched the show bates motel it was one of my favorite shows for a while like super sad but it's about norman bates uh before he became like the man in the psycho movie right and they portrayed him as having dissociative identity disorder right and so he would commit these murders when he was in another personality really cool show um it's it's long done now but i'm sure you can find it if you wanted to watch it uh but i love the way they portrayed him as having this disorder as a result of like trauma right and extreme stress in his life really really interesting show but the, again the concept here 
is that you have something that happened that's so severe that you dissociate from it, hence the name, and create different identities to help you deal with it. And there's a lot of memory loss with this disorder, but it really, as I mentioned, depends heavily on the relationship between the different personalities, right? So the most common Right, which means there's like one dominant person about each other. Right. So if somebody is like personality A and A is their dominant personality, A knows about B and C and D, but B, C, and D don't know about each other and don't know about A. They don't know their these. This is by far the most common. The easiest to deal with is mutually cognizant. They all know about each other, right? And with mutually cognizant, it can actually be relatively easy to work with because you can ask to speak to the other personalities because they all know about each other. There's very little memory loss. And by far the most difficult is mutually amnesic. When they don't know about each other, there's profound memory loss. And it can be very, very challenging to work with this individual because you have to wait for each personality to emerge and explain it to each personality. And you're kind of at the mercy of waiting for them to come forward, right? Uh, not the most common disorder, but there's, again, a lot of portrayals of this um, in the media. They changed the name because it was thought that it wasn't a full personality. Instead of multiple personalities, it was um, dissociated identities. Right, they're, they're like fragments of an identity. They're not anything like full or whole. And I have to tell you, I have a, I have like a story with this. Uh, I have seen this once, only once my whole life, right? And it was wild because I didn't know what it was when it happened. Uh, when I was training to be a therapist, I had a young woman, a uh, college student, because I was on a college campus up in Humboldt, uh, and so I had this young woman who came in and I had diagnosed her with depression, right? Really, really like quiet, really like down and low, um, hence the depression diagnosis. Like I would describe her like mousy, like super shy and um, intimidated, very introverted, having a hard time with being away at college. She missed her family. She didn't have a lot of friends. And we met for like six weeks, six or seven weeks, something like that. And every time she'd come in and we talk about similar stuff and she was like very quiet, very shy, very like um, emotional. And then all of a sudden, like it was like week seven or eight, she came in and she was just wildly different. And she was really up. She was talking a million miles a minute, really animated, talking to all these people she had never mentioned. And in my mind, and we'll get here soon, I was like, oh, she has bipolar disorder. I'm seeing the manic side. Because sometimes that happens. You can see a client for a long time. You only see some of their stuff. And so in my, my notes, I made a note like manic episode, possible manic episode, talked to my supervisor about it. And we changed her diagnosis to bipolar disorder. Didn't think a whole lot of it, but it was the next session that it got interesting. So she comes in the following week. And the first thing that she says to me is I want to apologize for not being here last week, right? It's really not like me but I missed our session and I'm really sorry. Like, I don't really know where I was, but I know I wasn't here and I'm sorry. And like, so at this point, get my full attention, right? Um, I was like, well, no, like you were here. I'm glad you, but I'm glad you brought it up. You were really different last week and I wanted to talk to you about it. And she's back to quiet and shy and depressed and mousy again. And she's like, no, like I, I wasn't here. Like, like, I, I honestly, I don't remember where I was. Like, she was so confused. She's like, I just feel bad. I'm not really like the kind of person to like flake out on stuff. And I like, I had my notes, right? And I'm like, yeah, you were here and you talked about this person and this person and this and this and that. And she's like, I think you have me like confused with somebody. I don't know any of those people. Like, are, are you sure? Like, she's trying to be really polite. Like, you know, saying like, are you sure that that's like, that's me? You're thinking of somebody else. And I'm trying to be really polite and not be like, you're the one in the therapy chair, not me, right? Like, like I know where I am. Like, I'm grounded. I know what's happening here. Uh, and we, like, did this, like, little, like, awkward dance for, like, 10 minutes of, like, I was here. No, you weren't. Yes, you were. Like, back and forth. 
and it felt really important, right? Like to deal with and, and we couldn't move past it. So as a therapy, as a therapist trainee, you're recording your videotapes and you get to watch those videotapes with the supervisor and like go through them and how well you did and all this stuff. Super awkward by like far, it's really uncomfortable. But in this one instance, it was incredibly handy. So I was like, if you don't mind, like, I will go get the tape from last time so that we can like settle this. <laughs> Basically, I'll go get it so I can show you that you were here, right? Um, but I didn't say that. Uh, and so I go get the tape. Um, it was literally like a, a VHS tape, right? Um, and then I got my supervisor because this was really like abnormal. And my supervisor came in and sat down. We played the tape. She was there. I was not wrong, <laughs> right? Uh, and she just starts crying. She's like, that's me. But who am I talking about? What am what, what, what am I wearing? Like, that that's me, but that's not me. I don't remember that. And I'm just like, absolutely, like my like mind is going, like, what is happening right now, right? And, uh, it was so wild. It was the only time I've ever seen this. And it turned out she had been having these gaps in memory, right? These blackouts, if you will, which are really common with this disorder, that she had created a very extroverted, outgoing part of her personality to counter the shy introverted part that was struggling with being away from home and not having friends. And like when she switched to that other personality, she had no memory of it at all, right? Uh, and wild, and it was so sad because I had to refer her out. I wasn't qualified to help her as someone who was a trainee. So I never got to see her again and I have no idea what happened. And that was so painful for me because like I cared, right? Uh, but that was the one time I've seen this and just the look on her face, anytime anyone says like, oh, this is something that is faked, like watching her watch herself on this film and have no clue what she's looking at, like watching herself, but not remembering it and just crying. It was so like, just it shifted my perspective on this so drastically. Um, and it can be that way where people have memory loss when they switch, right? And so there's a lot of like journaling that you do to help you um, keep track, uh, but really, really wild. And the personalities can be very different from each other. She, as her core identity was very shy and introverted. This other personality was very extroverted and outgoing. And oftentimes the identities serve a purpose. Yeah. I don't know if I've seen any of it. I've never seen it ever again in, in I mean in movies, right? But uh, you know, in person, that was the only movie I've ever seen any of it. I, in, 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 in. Yeah. So just kind of a random question. It's not super important, but was she mean to the other ones that? Because you remember she had Oh, that has yeah. eaten at me for years. Yes. Like, so I, I I always like somebody always asked that, right? And it drives me nuts. Like it must have been written down somewhere in like her planner or phone or whatever. And like she didn't act like she didn't know me. Like when she sat down, she knew who I was. She interacted with me like we knew each other. And she came to the session, right? So there was some shared memory. There had to be for her to be there. Right. And so it could be that maybe that one didn't remember, but in our primary one didn't remember, but that one would have. I, I never got to see her again to know, but that's something that my whole like it's been 10 years or more, like 15 years, maybe. And I still to this day wonder, like, how did she know to come to the session and know me and what was going on? And I'll never know. Um, but yeah, there had to be something right? because she was still there. Really wild. Right. Again, I've never seen it. Uh, beyond that, but um, what you see with this disorder is that kind of memory loss, very, very common. Um, and again, um, I I'll write it up here, but Bates Motel is probably my favorite portrayal of this just because they take Norman and he shifts to like this uh, version of his mom in a way, and he has no memory for what happens when he shifts. Um, and it's really, really like interesting to watch. It was a good show. It was sad, but good. Sad but good. Any other like questions, thoughts, anything? Yeah. Okay. And it is, uh, is it, she's good now, but like if something like traumatic happens, she can like, it's not good, but she's not she's mm -hmm. like, she's like, she's not old, but she's older. Um, 
like when she was younger, like she was just diagnosed as a uh, borderline because she would switch so fast. Yeah. She five minutes, she'd be fine. The next minute, like she'd be angry, crying, and screaming. And we're like, oh, it's borderline, right? And then it, we later found out she never, she wasn't really good at communicating with anything. She like would never remember why she was upset ever. Huh. We were, it was super weird. Like you're like, oh, but you were just screaming. She was like, what are you talking about? Like she would just like freak out and then she would pass out. Like she would just like like pass out and then she would sleep for hours because like she was so exhausted. And yeah. Exhausted. Yeah. And then she had this one, she I think she only has four, but she has this one where if she like gets freaked out about anything, she just like it's like she's almost like she's violent. Mm. She has to like protect herself. It's like insane. Like it's really crazy. And growing up, like like with her, it was just interesting. Our parents kind of kept her in the middle of the room because you know you never knew what you were gonna get. Yeah. And she just was very, very, very interesting. She's twenty nine now. She has a job. And she has a husband. Like she's like good now. But like growing up, it was like sure. It was super deep. Yeah, and how like, you know, scary on the other side is like the family. Well, like, what do you mean you don't remember? You just did that, right? Like, or and it and it can show up that way. And the personality is like you could have one that's really angry, you could have one that's really low, you could have one that's really old and really young. Like they can be so different. Um, Italy and the entire two weeks we were there, she yelled at me. Like she had a different personality and it's like this, yeah. I'm gonna go do whatever I want like restless like crazy and then we came back and she was like you went to Italy like she had no like she wow. had no idea like absolutely no idea and we were showing her pictures and she's like what like she was like was freaking out like, yeah like, she was pretty young at that point but yeah so she, wow. we went to Italy she went that is wild right and like and <laughs> right and people oftentimes thinks it's like think it's fake right because it feels like it has to be like unreal like you're faking it of course you don't remember what happened a minute ago right or whatever uh but even when they do brain scans like the different personalities will have different like brain activity levels and it is really like wild and sometimes people get good enough at like identifying them that sometimes they give them names and like yeah. you know like you know which personality they are like right now and uh the most common by far is like three three personalities um uh, but it's anything more than two so some people have two some people have three uh i think the most that i wrote it down somebody asked it i mean 126 was the most that was documented uh but like three or four is really common like a really common number um, and again, typically they serve a purpose, not always, but they often have like a purpose to um, their identity. Yeah. Well, have you seen a short film inside? No. It's, it's like this guy, I don't know if it is, but it's like this guy who has, he's in a mental hospital and he's trying to get out and he has to talk to the therapist. Okay. But he's talking to like all these different personalities and they're all telling one of them what to say. Yeah. But I don't know if that's. This isn't it just switch in that one kind of zone. Right. Yeah, and that tends to be like the media loves to portray it that way, right? Like almost as if it's almost a hallucination or like all of them are present at once. And I think that's more just for us as the viewer to understand what's happening because it's confusing. But it tends to be that you're one and then you switch. Like so it could be in a moment of anxiety or stress or fear or just emotion. In a moment of emotion, you oftentimes it's almost like someone flips the switch and the other personality comes forward. Uh, typically only one is present at a time, but the media portrays it that way a lot where like more than one is there. I think, you know, like the reasoning is just for us, it's more dramatic that way, right? Um, and it's really commonly confused with schizophrenia as well. And this would be a great question for me to ask you. Uh, they're not the same thing, right? Schizophrenia, which we'll talk about later, one personality, right? But there are fragmented connections in that one personality versus here we have two or more, but the media loves to combine them. And if we want to get wild, in theory, you could have a sub-personality that had schizophrenia. That would be really uncommon, but it could happen if we want to like really go for it um, here. But typically um, it's just different fragmented identities. There was a, yeah. It's like overriding. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So it could be that the dominant personality, like um, an individual's like physical person and personality isn't the dominant one. And so a sub personality could end up being more dominant and taking over. Um, it's so hard to know. And it, this, is, this is a lengthy, lengthy process of like slowly eliminating personalities, right? And that's kind of the main um, goal with this is you do something called fusion where you try and identify the different personalities and then get rid of as many of them as you can. You fuse them together. So really like bad example in terms of a movie, but me, myself and Irene, if any of you seen that with Jim Carrey, like uh, he is like a pushover. Everyone like walks all over him. So he develops this personality that's like really outgoing and like almost like violent and like, uh, and it has a purpose, right? And so you find ways to incorporate those parts of that identity into the main identity, but sometimes it's hard to know which one is the main one, right? Especially if they've had it for a long time. Yeah? When I was in my early adolescence, uh -huh. I was diagnosed with something similar to this. I don't know if it was DID or not, mm -hmm. um, but like basically what would happen was like, I think I may have had like, I don't know, three personalities and what would happen was like, I would like sometimes like write a paper for school and I'd like completely forget that I wrote the paper. Huh. I mean, that I wrote the paper and um, I would like look at it. And I'd be like, I definitely did not write that. Um, and only one of them remembered like my trauma, I think. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting and weird. I think it was like cog the cognizant. Okay. And did it just kind of fade over time yeah, or? I, I don't forget. Okay. Um, and really helped manage it yeah it's like mm -hmm. mostly okay like, yeah and, and and like every other disorder on a spectrum right right so sometimes people have this in a very mild way and it's hard because we all have different parts of our identities and our personality right like i was actually thinking this yesterday like um you know that like we all have an ability to adapt to situations right so maybe you're with people that you're friends with and you feel very comfortable and you're really outgoing and then you're with another group of people and you might be kind of more shy and reserved, right? Like I imagine a lot of you are different in here than you are out with your friends, right? Or your family. You have different elements that come forward. DID is like an extreme version of that, right? Where like those identities or parts of your personality become an identity, right? And like then the memory loss is what makes it so hard. Yeah. This thing, I asked her like, how would you describe it? She just said it sucks balls. <laughs> right there we go. Right, and a lot of disorders do. Right, um, you know they're hard. Right, and especially if I mean you know like it physically looks like you, so people are going to treat you as the person they know. And if it's not actually you, like I mean, how difficult is that? It's really really challenging. And again, a lot of these are rooted in stress and trauma. Right, something happened that you couldn't handle, so you dissociate from it and create another personality and that's when we tend to switch is in moments of stress and trauma and so we can do some things like um hypnotherapy is one thing that we might do to try and bring personalities forward under hypnosis you're much more uh like suggestible so we can say like i'd like to speak to this other identity and sometimes you can access that in a different way but the main goal of did in terms of treatment the first thing you have to do is help a client understand what's happening Right. And this can take a while if they have a lot of identities, if they have three different personalities and they don't know about each other, you have to wait for each one to emerge. You educate each one of them. Right. And that can take some time. Um, if they share memory, it's much easier. But you help them understand what's going on, like maybe having them journal. It's a big one to um, recover gaps in memory. And it's wild. If you look at journals of people who have DID, the handwriting is different. The expressive style is different. So like one might be really small and neat and the next one's like very creative and loopy and big, like their handwriting is even changing from personality to personality within the same physical um, like person. So trying to recover those gaps and then you're trying to integrate into one personality. So what is the function of each one? Let's understand it and then try and eliminate them if, if possible. If you have four, let's try and get down to three and then let's try and get down to two you know, and like identifying like triggers for switching and things like that. Uh, very difficult to deal with when they aren't aware of each other because it can take some serious time. Mm -hmm.
That's what I did in my therapy. Like we like try to eliminate the downturn. Yeah. yeah, and that helps, right? Like if you have three or four and you eliminate even one, you know, and then maybe you can eliminate another one, right? You're getting closer to being more integrated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when they do like for, you mean, uh, how do you mean like in terms of? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, what I meant to say is, uh, if it wasn't clear, is that there's different activity patterns that you would notice. So, like, um, everybody has, like, a natural, like, level of energy and brain waves that you would see if you were to do, like, a, an EEG or something like that. And so what you might see in an fMRI or some other thing along those lines is just different patterns of activity, more than different parts of the brain, same parts, just different levels of activity from one personality to another. Um, indicating there, I mean, there is some biological evidence behind it because a lot of people think it's fake, right? I mean, it seems fake and people have tried to fake it, especially to get out of crimes. Like, oh, it was my other identity that did it. We'll talk about some serial killers in the end uh, and last unit. And some people have tried to fake that a different personality committed the crime, right? And then you have to go through this whole process of trying to prove that, which is ridiculously difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Someone with the ID, right? Um, yeah. If they're one of their personalities, like they're happy, it's like shits and giggles all the time. But you see their um, the dopamine is the hippocampus, right? So that's what the dopamine is under, whatever. Um, I would, the hippocampus tends to be in charge of memory, but yeah. But it's like, it's, yeah. Not necessarily, right? But you might see, I mean, the depression one, maybe, right? When we're depressed, like different areas of the brain are more or less active, like the frontal lobe, the amygdala, the hippocampus is one of them as well. Uh, and so it might be like if one personality was really depressed, you would see a, a, like a difference there, but not necessarily with like memory and, and things, but with depression, it's totally possible. So uh, let me take the last bit of our, our time here to talk about the stuff that's over there on uh, on the board. So let me get to our uh, Canvas page really quickly here. Uh, so on Monday, so that is the, the last unit for this or the last chapter for this unit, um, which is wild to think that we're already like one third of the way through the semester, maybe even a little bit more. Uh, but we have our first exam on Monday. And so I just want to talk about that a little bit, make sure that you are as prepared as you can be um, for that. So on Monday, uh, we have our first test and your test will be taken on Canvas. Now I started doing this in all of my classes during COVID or like right after COVID when we came back. And I feel like it's like such a kinder way to do exams. Like exams cause people a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear. And sometimes that's crippling for people. Uh, my partner has awful test anxiety, and so I think it's maybe shaped a little bit by that. Uh, but the exam will be on Canvas. So what that means is we won't have class in person on Monday. You'll be taking your exam online. My other class that's right after this, right? Yours is today, right? Uh, but for on Monday, what will happen is the exam will open up at 12.01 a.m. So basically uh, Monday morning, like right off the bat, and it'll close at 11.59 p.m. So you have this hour and 15 minutes free to take it. I'm giving you that time. But if you would rather take it later in the day and sleep in uh, or take it earlier, if you're up, right, it's up to you. You just need to complete it by 11.59 p.m. and it will be gone. So if you'd rather sleep in, have a nice breakfast, think of me, right? Do you have a nice breakfast? Right, um, you're welcome to do that and take it later in the day if that works for you. Or you can take it at this time that will be free. So during the exam, you can use your notes, you can use your book, you can use anything at your disposal. Please take it alone, right? Take it on your own. Uh, but I would really encourage you to study like you would for a normal in-person test. And so let's um, let's look at it a little bit together. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the exam, like I want to make this over <laughs> so badly. Uh, the exam is over here where it says quizzes. I don't know if you can see it. When you click on quizzes, um, you'll see it's right here. It has 82 questions on it. It's worth 100 points, right? And you have 75 minutes to take it. You have the exact amount of time you would have if you took it in here. 
Now, I haven't made it any harder because it's online. So it's not like artificially hard because it's open note and open book. Uh, but a couple of things you'll see when you click on this. Um, if I click on student view, it won't let me show it to you. So you have 75 minutes to complete the exam and you only get one attempt. So make sure you're ready and organized before you begin. Now, what I mean in my head, like to me, when I say ready and organized, make sure you have 75 minutes to take it, right? You don't wanna take it if you're out of time. Make sure that you have good internet connection. You have a quiet place to take it. Make sure that you've studied and you've prepared that you're ready, right? Uh, once you're ready and you hit start, you're in it. So just make sure you know that you have that one attempt. As I said, you can use your notes, you can use your book, but if you're trying to understand and look up each answer, you will run out of time. And that is a little bit purposeful, right? If you took it in here, 75 minutes, and even on here, it's plenty of time as long as you studied and prepared. But if you're trying to look everything up, it won't. So just, again, make sure you do study. Uh, Canvas will stop your test when you run out of time. So if you don't know what's something, skip it and come back to it. That's totally fine. You can skip ahead and come back. Um, and then you'll hit submit at the end. And you'll get a grade for everything but the short answer. There are a few short answer questions, which I have to grade manually. But you'll get a grade for all the like uh, multiple choice and true false ones, which is the vast majority of the test. Now, a, a couple of things for those of you, some of you have taken classes with me before or you're in another class with me now. Uh, I will never trick you on an exam. There will never be a trick question. They're stupid. They do nothing but like cause anxiety, right? So if something seems unclear, read it again, right? I will never trick you. I want you all to do really well. So I've made a study guide for you and I wanna show you that as well. Um, but just make sure that you do study and use this most of the questions are multiple choice and true false. So if you're preparing it for those, you should be in good shape. But if you go right here, you can see study guide number one. And so after I finish making the exam, I go through and every single term or concept on the test, I put on the study guide. So if it's on here, make sure you know it. If it's not on here, you don't have to worry about it. Right, it won't be on the exam. So if it were me, and I'm like a ridiculous student, like I'm one of those students who like gets pissed if I miss one question on an exam. Like I still remember a test that I took in graduate school like 20 years ago that I didn't get an A on, right? Like I'm that student. Uh, obnoxious, but that's okay. Uh, I'll keep going. So if it were me, what I would do, I would write all of these terms out. I would type them all out. I'd have them printed in front of me. That way, if I'm taking the exam and I forget what... Uh, the five axes of the DSM are. I don't have to like go through the lecture, the book, my notes, everything and waste valuable time. I can just look at my study guide. It's right there, right? So it's up to you, but I think it's always better to over-prepare than to under-prepare, right? You don't want that moment halfway through the test where you're like, crap, I should have done more. And it causes anxiety and it spirals, right? So over-prepare, you can always dial it back. But if it were me, I would have all this written out in front of me. I'd review it, I'd study it. And then you can reference it during the exam. Because again, if you're trying to find it in the book or the lecture or the videos, it's going to eat up that time. And what I've noticed, um, and I keep track, um, the average amount of time people take is right around like 58 minutes. You have 75, so it's plenty of time. Just please study and prepare. If you study and you know everything on here, you'll be great, right? Um, I would expect you all to do quite well since you have your notes in your book. Um, it should be a very straightforward I think if anything, it's probably too easy. I should make it harder, but I'm not going to. So um, I hope that it goes well for all of you. That will open Monday. I'll send out a message Sunday night, just so you don't forget. But uh, but that will open up on Monday, and then you'll take it online and get a grade for almost everything right away. Okay. Uh, are there any questions about the exam? Yeah. Uh -huh. Not this exam, but we do the study guide for yeah. the other. Yeah, and you actually, if you um, if you saw on that last page, you actually already have the study guides for exam two and three. So um, what you could always do too, if, if you find that like that's helpful to have them, you could be using them in the future to prepare as we go along, right? If that, that. Again, mainly multiple choice and true false. If you study and prepare, it will be fine. It will be great. I would expect the average to be very high, given that you have your notes and look and everything. Uh, the other thing I just want to mention really quickly, I still have a couple of minutes, 
Um, I sent out a message about an extra credit opportunity. How many of you saw the message? That's fantastic. Um, I just wanted to talk about it for a second. Uh, so part of um, part of like this chapter on stress and trauma is finding ways to deal with that. We'll talk about that more in the next unit. Uh, and I think I've mentioned the idea of self-care. We talked about it before in here just a little bit briefly. But what I sent out is this announcement. If you're interested in doing this, um, I sent out a little thing for extra credit. Uh, what you can do, and I'll change the due date. Um, this just be something that's available to you to do anytime once um, throughout the semester. But what you're going to do is read a little article about self-care. It's brief. Good. Um, and then you're going to do five self-care practices. And my purpose of this is twofold. One, it's to encourage you to do things that are considered self-care, um, just to take care of yourself. And two, uh, I'm writing a book about self-care. Um, and the whole book is just examples, like for the most part, after I talk about what it is. And um, I already have like 50 examples from students, but I need some more. So um, the pictures that you take, if you take a good picture and like describe it well, like, and you're interested, I'll throw you in the book with the other examples. That sounded mean. I'll throw you in there. I'll include you. In there. That sounds nicer. But, uh, but what you're going to do is you're going to take and share and like, upload five images of you practicing self-care. And it can be anything, right? Let's say you go get ice cream as a form of self-care. I think that's a great form of self-care, but you should invite me. Um, so you go get ice cream, you could take a picture of the ice cream, right? Like, and then you would describe it and upload it. And so what I did is I gave you a list of options. I have a lot of ones that people have submitted, like the same ones. And so I need some images of the things that are on here. So if you want to just take extra pictures or do extra um, things that aren't on your list, that would be great. But you're just going to upload the image and then like a short description of what you did. Don't make it complicated. Self-care can be anything. Like it could be a nap. It could be a snack. It could be going on a walk. It could be enjoying the air outside. Um, it could be going to get your nails done. It could be anything. Anything that allows you a moment to care for yourself in some way. And if you want to do that, like for extra credit, um, you can upload those images on here uh, and then yeah, you'll get extra credit for doing so. So I will reward you for going to get ice cream and taking a picture of it, right? I think that's very nice of me. <laughs> or cake, self-care, self-cake, whatever, right? Either one. So um, I'll hang out for a few minutes if you have any questions, but I won't see you Monday because of the exam. Good luck. You got this. And I'll see you Wednesday for the next uh, year. You too. Thank you. Uh, five. So basically, one for each picture. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> You're like, <"Oop." laughs> oh, good. Okay. I like. I can't remember. Yeah. Upload and I chose that. Mm -hmm. I used to love technology for it. Like, cause and so luckily you the image of it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally I still, I still yeah. And I haven't updated it yet, but I saw that you emailed it to me, so I will update that. Thank you so yeah. Thank you for saving it. You know that I double time So it should be. Let me on. Thank you. Yeah, close this for, you know, some teachers. yeah, no, thank you for checking. What's your last name? Okay, let me just make sure that I have it in here um, while you're with me. I don't want you to not have what you need. Yep, so you have uh, 75 extra minutes. So when you go to take it, it'll show up as 150 minutes. Okay, and also for the self-care thing, is it going to be over? Yeah, for the rest of the semester. So um, I'm not sure if I need to, I'll change the date so it can be any time between now and then. Oh, okay, yeah, it's just because I was going to talk about it. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know. No, I'm going to make it so you can do it anytime between okay. now and the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. No, no. Um, so I just, I set that so that I would talk about it today. Um, but I'm going to, ch I'm changing it right now. It'll be due by the end of the semester. Yes, you have all the way till, till the end to do it. Of course. Do... You put that in May. May. How you doing? Nice to see you. Okay. <laughs> <Hey. laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny to say, but sometimes that is, you know, all we can do, right? <laughs> 